So, hi everybody, I'm Amy. Um, welcome to Unreasonable Dreaming, the Fashion Fiction's conversation evening. Um, I'm Associate Professor of Fashion and Sustainability at Nottingham Trent University um, and the founder of Fashion Fictions. The intention of this event this evening is to reflect on the project's activities so far, um, to celebrate the diversity and the creativity of all the visions that have been generated in the project um, and with the input of my guest speakers um, to connect the project with the wider world and kind of related areas of knowledge, research and practice. Unfortunately, Daniel Welch, who was also meant to be here, is ill, so we, we wish, wish him a speedy recovery, um, but I'm delighted to have Annabella Pollens and Kate Fletcher here to um, contribute to the conversation. So the event is marking the end of the current funding of Fashion Fictions. Um, it's been funded by a Research, Development and Engagement Fellowship from the Arts and Humanities Research Council over the past 21 months. Um, but just to be clear, the project isn't ending. Um, it's just the end of this chapter. There's definitely more to come. Uh, but I will, before I, in case I forget later on, um, take the opportunity to say thanks to the many, many people who have been involved with the project so far as contributors, as collaborators, I'll particularly say thank you to Matty, who's sitting there, who was the research fellow working on the project uh, for the first year. So this evening, as hopefully you've got the gist, we're going for a relaxed vibe. So I hope you're enjoying the wonderful food and drinks from Blend. Um, I'm going to do it in two parts. So the first part will be, um, I'll talk a bit about the project and then we'll hear from Bella. Uh, then we'll have a break at about seven o'clock um, and then in the second part, we'll hear from Kate um, and then have the opportunity to open up for questions and hopefully a bit of um, discussion. Um, OK, so as I say, I'm going to start by talking a bit about the project. Some people here will be very familiar with it, some people not. So I'll start from the beginning. I founded the project in 2020, um, but had actually started developing the ideas a few years before that. I looked back and the first thing I did, I think was in 2017. Um, so I've been working in fashion and sustainability for a long time, about 20 years now, um, as a designer and as a researcher. Um, I, about six years ago, I published um, my book, Folk Fashion. I've brought books with me to do the kind of an in-person version of the Zoom thing where you grab the book off your bookshelf and go, here's the book. So I thought I would bring them with me and do the same thing. So I did this book, Folk Fashion, Understanding Homemade Clothes, which was developed from my PhD, um, where I was thinking about uh, making our own clothes uh, in, a, in a culture dominated by um, shop-bought items and how that might relate to sustainability. So I'd done all of that work um, and I was looking around, kind of ready for a, a new big project. And the question that I was asking myself was, how can I be helpful? I can really remember those words being in my head. How can I be helpful? What can I do? Um, in what was by that time quite a kind of crowded area, there's so much going on in terms of fashion and sustainability. And I think probably amongst the people here today, um, you've probably very aware of the many problems associated with the way that we commonly use our clothes today, particularly in the global north, um, in terms of environmental and social impacts from production through to use and disposal. And of course, these problems are just made so much worse by the ever increasing volumes of garments that are being produced in an industry that's driven by economic growth. So there's really like a lot to go at. And I was trying to think what what can I do? What's my contribution at this point? And the thing that I came to was um, kind of just a, a feeling that I kept encountering that the way things are at the moment feels quite stuck to people. Um, and so I was seeing kind of incremental initiatives in the industry that don't address the real problems that we have. Um, and I had the, the direct experience 
uh, of finding that ideas that challenge or even just kind of question the status quo are so quickly dismissed as being naive or impossible. Like, well, that's not going to happen. Um, in a way that like, if you can't immediately offer the path to change and showing how something could happen step by step, it's just so easily and kind of readily dismissed. Um, and I guess that just, there's such a certainty to people when they say, well, that's not going to happen. Um, and maybe a sense that they're kind of being the grown-ups in the room and they're being realistic, um, realistic about the type and scale of change that we can expect, that they're being reasonable, being reasonable, sort of uh, being professional, uh, being yeah, realistic. But of course, the problem is that the incremental change that is reasonable to expect is unrealistic. It's based on the idea that we can continue business as usual and maybe just tweak, tweak it a bit around, around the edges. But we can't because business as usual is causing global devastation. So my feeling is it's definitely time to be unreasonable, hence the name of the event. So I've been writing a book about the project um, and the things that we've found out so far. And as part of that process, I'm really enjoying kind of reading and discovering ideas that connect with this work in different ways. Uh, and to continue the, the Zoom-esque pulling books from the bookshelf, I'll, I'll wave some more at you. Um, so a, a first quote is from this sociologist, Eric Olinwright. The number of tabs isn't an indication of how much I like the book, by the way. It's just where I am in the process. Um, so Envisioning Real Utopias by Eric Olin Wright. And he says, the actual limits of what is achievable depend in part on the beliefs people hold about what sorts of alternatives are viable. So if we feel that the world is fixed, we don't bother to explore ideas that we consider to be impossible. And therefore, we don't have the chance to kind of bring them into the light and look at them. So it becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. The ideas remain impossible and we find ourselves, yes, locked into a kind of unsustainable, unsatisfying system. But I think we can also reverse that logic. So if we give ourselves permission to explore and develop ideas that do seem impossible at this point, that in itself could shift the boundaries of the possible. I find that a very seductive idea. So I guess my kind of hunch was that we needed a safe space where we could engage with things that might feel impossible. And let's just see what happens. Um, we need a space where we can investigate what alternative fashion systems might look like to think this through kind of critically and creatively um, and generate, hopefully along the way, a sort of expanded sense of possibility. So this is what the project tries to do. Uh, it brings people together to generate experience and reflect on engaging fictional visions of alternative fashion cultures and systems. So it's allowing us to pause and ask ourselves, what do we wish for? Forget about what's possible, forget about the pathway. How would we like things to be? So the, the kind of structure of the project is about exploring what if questions. So what if the world was like this? And we're imagining contemporary realities in parallel worlds. So not the futures in this world, as many speculative uh, design kind of projects do, but a parallel world. You step through a portal to another world where it's also 2023, but people live with their clothes differently in some way. This world's kind of split off from ours at some point in history. And they're very much kind of positive and enticing worlds. Um, in terms of individual satisfaction, social justice, and sustainability. Um, and there's a rule, which people, people challenge a little bit sometimes, but um, the kind of the rule of the game is that they should be physically possible, but push beyond what feels plausible to us today or to the person creating it at that point. So you can't just kind of abandon all laws of physics, biology, whatever. So that bit's a little bit too convenient. Um, and there's a three-stage structure to the project. So at stage one, we create brief written outlines of fictional fashion cultures and systems. So there's some examples on your tables of some, some fictions. Um, I find it really hard to choose, <laughs> choose them. I was interviewed by a journalist yesterday and she asked a question that people always ask like, oh, which are your favorite fictions? I was like, 
like choosing a favourite child. <laughs> and I've got more than one, so I can't do that. Um, so I, I got a random sample just to share with you as a little kind of insight into the things that people come up with. Um, and so they're just 100 word descriptions of these parallel worlds. At stage two, we build on the outlines and create visual and material prototypes. So if you've had the chance to look around the, the World Tour exhibition trail, which is installed in this area, um, there are examples of some of the many, many prototypes that people have created in the project. And I invite people when they're making these to imagine that they've stepped through a portal, they've visited the parallel world, um, they've taken a photo or they've picked something up to bring back to show us what life is like there. Um, and then at stage three, we find ways to step into the world. So ways that we can enact and experience what life is like there. So through all of these kind of speculative uh, activities, together is this kind of crowdsourced effort. We, we're kind of extending our collective vocabulary of how fashion might be otherwise. And I see this happening a bit as the project develops that people will kind of point to things like, oh, that's quite World 91, isn't it? <laughs> or like, oh, this pretty World 54. Um, so the, 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 the worlds become these kind of shared reference points um, that are more diverse than the, the, the world that we perhaps experience day to day. What happens when the project, when the activities are working really well, um, is that they, taking part, can help people to generate a new perspective on the real world. So from the experience of kind of going to this fictional place and looking back um, from this new vantage point, we kind of see um, challenges, possibilities, pathways for change in a different way. And perhaps most powerfully, I think the most kind of uh, fundamental element of it is this, this thing that I, I talked about earlier on, trying to extend our collective sense of just what might be possible. And I've seen people shift from a sort of, uh, res a sort of resigned, like, that's never going to happen, to a kind of indignant, hands-on hips, why isn't this already happening? And it's really nice, like that shift's so powerful, and just kind of want to bottle it, because um, it feels like the necessary foundation to any other change. Like we have to believe that that change is possible. Um, and this, so the, the the work of the project ties in with loads of people in very different contexts who are working to encourage imagination in the interests of sustainability and social justice. Um, so it's just one example. Talila Lewis, who's a, a, a abolitionist community lawyer, educator, and organizer in the U.S., says. When we create space for ourselves and others to dream, we embody recurring hope, active love, critical resistance and radical change. We're reminded that those who came before us dreamed of that which no one thought could exist. Their dreams are the reasons we are now living the impossible. So the project's all about dreaming, about imagination. Um, and before I pass over to Bella, because I think there's lots there that you could get stuck into. Um, I just, I'll just highlight two kind of um, elements of the, the project that uh, feel important to kind of um, uh, bring out at this point, which are participation and playfulness. So participation, this is a really participatory project. It doesn't exist without people taking part. Um, and it has a, a really open ethos. So everyone is welcome to join in. Some speculation projects are about kind of designers, skilled designers doing the speculating and everyone else is allowed to be the audience. They can look at the stuff and sort of go, hmm, like that. Um, I'm not into that. That's not the ethos of this project. Um, I really like feed off the, the brilliant creativity of everybody. Um, so this kind of process of trying to in involve people in, in imagination together, sometimes called collective imagination, kind of social imagination, the activity of collectively imagining uh, a better future society. And from my perspective of this, this project, really everyone is qualified. So everyone taking part is an expert 
because they get dressed every day and manage to navigate the world. Like they're an expert in the fashion system because they take part in it. And we do have some participants who bring specialist expertise in maybe fashion and textile practice, theory, history, which is wonderful. But that wearing expertise is just as valuable. So there's um, more than 200 fictions on the world on the on the website at the moment. Um, and I think as the examples to have put on the, the table show, there's a really diverse range of responses from minor amendments of the existing fashion system to kind of radical reimaginings of life on Earth. We've, there are a few that kind of rewrite all of human civilization. People are quite bold. Um, they're good like that. Um, and yeah, one more thing which is on a few of the tables is uh, this, this map. There's one little bit of my analysis. So this is an analysis of the first 120 worlds um, and highlights the themes that come out and you can kind of spot across across different fictions and it ranges from the clothes themselves, how they're made, how they're worn, um, how they're disposed of, how they're washed, um, the places and spaces of fashion, the people who are involved, the skills and knowledge involved, aspects of embodiment, the, the kind of cultural uh, worlds that, that sit around the clothes, um, and then bigger, it, it kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So themes around nature, around economics and law, and real kind of big global issues. So, I mean, that scope is amazing if you want to come and have a look at one of those uh, in the break. Um, and again, sort of also in the, the examples in the exhibition trail, you can really see this kind of broad scope of ideas that people are exploring. Um, so another quote, this is not from something that I have in hard copy, um, uh, but Jeff Mulgan, who's the author of a report called the, the Imaginary Crisis, highlights the importance of opening up this process of kind of social imagination to diverse participants. And he says, if you care at all about emancipation, it must matter that seriously organized social imagination is being so monopolized by the already rich and powerful, such as think tanks in California, funded by and reflecting the na narrow worldview of male billionaires. And so little is being done to shape a world in line with the interests and values of the great majority. So I'm trying in my little <laughs> corner of the world to try and um, push back against that uh, kind of monopolization and, and create a, a space that encourages um, imagination. And it's uh, very satisfying um, to be able to say that the project has involved thousands of participants. I've got it to about 3000, I think, um, across six continents. Um, and this diversity is just absolutely crucial because it enables us to benefit from ideas that come from different cultural contexts, which respond to different contemporary realities. So my reality when I'm speculating is different to a student in Dubai or somebody in somewhere in India or in Colombia or the many different places where people have taken part. Um, and you know, the, the different visions that, that they might come up with. Um, and the, the future of the project really is about um, trying to find ways to support people to run their own fashion fictions activities in different settings to try and kind of um, keep working at that uh, plurality. Um, okay, so that was the participation bit. And now the playfulness, that's the second aspect that I want to highlight. The project is really intentionally playful. It's part of this idea of kind of a space to imagine openly. Um, this idea, as I said earlier, of kind of leaving the concerns of how will this happen at the door. Um, let's step into the magic circle of the game and enjoy imagining what this fictional world might be like. Um, just not worry for a bit about how it might happen. So I'm really encouraging people to be kind of inventive, irreverent, maybe silly as they imagine their worlds. And to be honest, when I'm making up my worlds and I'm trying to think what's the backstory to how this thing developed, I go with the, the idea that makes me giggle the most. <laughs> like I'm really guided by like something that makes me snort. That's what, I, that's what I like to write down in the hope it might have the same effect on somebody else. Um, and so my next exhibit is this book, 
bad, bad environmentalism, um, irony and irreverence in the ecological age. I really like this book. Um, and the author, Nicole Seymour, outlines the sensibilities that are typically associated with environmentalism, including guilt, shame, prescriptiveness, sentimentality, sincerity and self-righteousness. And I think that we could make similar observations about sustainable fashion, a sort of an overriding tone in the discourse um, of kind of wholesomeness, privilege, maybe moralistic kind of tones. Um, things that la they largely focus on consumer choices rather than a more expansive view of the fashion experience. And so Nicole Seymour is saying that a broader repertoire of effective modes such as irreverence, frivolity, irony, perversity and playfulness might enable us to create new modes of resistance, new forms of community and new opportunities for inquiry into environmental crisis. And the thinking underpinning fashion fictions sort of runs along similar, similar lines. Just have this hunch that kind of tapping into a broader spectrum of sensibilities, aesthetics, spheres of knowledge will allow us to bring much more of ourselves uh, to the collective process of transforming our fashion systems. So, sort of returning to this idea of being unreasonable, that I mentioned earlier, um, it feels like a kind of kindred spirit of being playful, kind of being playful but radical, being unreasonable. It's, being playful allows us to question what reasonableness is and on what basis we might think of a notion as being reasonable or ridiculous. Um, and I found that looking to the past helps with this, um, kind of noticing how differently life has been organised in different places at different times, how quickly things can change. Um, I'm particularly interested in looking at historical movements that have brought about inspiring change on a large or small scale, or at least have dreamed of it. Um, one more book. Uh, this one is Green Utopias. Um, and the, the author, sociologist Lisa Garforth, um, talks really nicely about utopianism, not as a kind of fixed blueprint for the perfect society, but kind of tentative, playful, partial visions that stimulate critical and creative reflection on alternatives to the way things are. And I think those kind of historical examples, I feel like I can feed off their courage and maybe we collectively can feed off the courage of people uh, it feels really key to kind of taking action. So all of that stuff was leading me up to my first guest. I feel like I'm a chat show host now. Um, so I'm very pleased to have Annabella Pollen here. She's a professor of visual and material culture at the University of Brighton um, with wonderfully diverse research interests. Um, but particularly what she's focusing on today is her research into untold histories in art and design, which includes utopian groups of the 20th century. Um, and I've been really inspired by uh, your research for a long time. Um, and I think you've got some stuff to share with us today. Um, and I should mention as well that Bella has taken part in lots of fashion fictions activities. So she's written stage one fictions, she's created prototypes, she has enacted. So you've got the full, the full range of experience. And I'm going to hand over to you. Thank, Thank you, you, Amy. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me OK if I hold the mic there? Hi. So um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. As Amy has just introduced me, I have been inspired by your work and by the Fashion Fictions, Fictions Project since I first heard of it, which I think must have been around the beginning of the lockdown, perhaps. Um, and I have done various uh, fashion fiction-y things and fashion fiction activities. So I, I wrote a hundred word world, not a, a masterpiece, I don't think, but I imagined a world where um, children would aim to um, be the most resourceful with textiles and they would play games in the playground imagining that they were about to win the Nobel Prize for textile resourcefulness and it was this sort of ambition and aspiration for, for every school child. Um, I co-hosted a workshop, we did a workshop for fashion historians and fashion theorists about how to write 
worlds, um, which I think some people here in the audience came to. That was really enjoyable. And then, yes, a prototyping workshop, so a stage two, where I worked in groups to take somebody else's world and kind of develop it to a next stage. So that was really interesting, working on um, a world where clothes, flamboyant clothes were outlawed and a sort of culture of speakeasy clubs had risen up. And so people would go to these secret places kind of after dark and exchange feather boas and spangles and things um, before the police kind of came and broke these these parties up. So that was fun to do. We did it in Nottingham actually and imagined that the these kind of underground rave type nights were happening in the ruins of retail, specifically the um, <laughs> the derelict Debenhams building in the town centre. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, enactments. I've taken part in a few of those. Six enjoyable weeks spent in Mushroom World, where I dressed once a week for the Mushroom Spirit Guides, um, who lead um, with their sort of knowledge and inspiration in that world, and their worshippers or devotees go and sort of, you know, pay homage to them once a week for an hour. So I, I enjoyed that one. Um, another world, which was an online only world, where dress can only be described in words. So any promotion of garments has to be done without any visuals. Um, so that was a real poetic challenge to kind of describe rather than show, to tell rather than show. And we involved, that involved writing concrete poetry and all sorts of things. And then uh, um, another in-person one that I did where it's a world where there's only Curtains, I think, is that right? So there's only kind of upholstery fabric and bits of elasticated strap. And a bunch of us had to kind of dress one another with what was available, which was not very much. And that was very interesting. A lot of togas um, were made. <laughs> but um, what I'm going to talk to you about is a couple of historical examples of utopian thinkers um, who I have researched and who have used dress as a kind of focal point for their visions and for, the, for both cases, it's a sort of vision of the, the world to come. So I have some books. Oops, feedback. So um, these are the projects that I'm going to talk to you about, and I'll add the books to the pile. I'll introduce them to you in more detail, but we're getting a nice kind of library of reading matter here. Another one. So um, the groups that I'm talking about predate my interest or involvement in... Um, fashion fictions, but I think both of them have some surprising resonances. Each of the groups that I'll talk to you about used imagination and projection to envisage the world that they wanted to bring into being, and each of them operated at the fringes of acceptability. So they are absolutely unreasonable dreamers, like the title of the event, but what they each did was they lived their dream. So I'm going to show you some visuals. We don't have projection facilities, so I have. Lovely. Could I put them on your lap? Yes. Um, I have a set of wipe clean small slides. These have been all over the place. I've, um, you know, well, I've given a talk on the canvas or, or um, in the forest, <laughs> I've used these uh, wipe clean slides. So the first group I'm going to talk to you about um, which you hopefully can see, and these slides are available for reference afterwards. So the first group is one that I'd like to reframe retrospectively as a pioneering fashion fiction project. Okay. So it's the curiously named Kindred of the Kibbo Kifts, and they were a group of around a thousand or so social reformers and spiritual seekers who roamed the hills and dales of the southeast of England, and who hoped to camp and to hike and to craft their way to world peace. Now their name, uh, Kibbo Kift, um, meant proof of strength. It was rather obscure. It came from an antiquarian um, dictionary of Cheshire colloquialisms, Kibbo Kift. But um, this proof of strength that they were aiming for signaled the kind of physical mental and spiritual strength that they were cultivating in order to survive the expected collapse of civilization. So let's have a look at another slide. This is the group camping and then the next slide um, shows a couple of members of Kibbo Kift at camp. So because Kibbo Kift was certain 
that the world was about to end, they put all of their energies into designing a new one. Um, and their leader was a novelist and a commercial artist, and he earned part of his income through advertising. And he and his creative conspirators were very well aware in the 1920s of all of the latest goings on in art and design and in literature. So this vision was informed by contemporaneous sort of avant-garde practices, but what they were imagining was a world that would go back to the very, very beginnings of time, a world that would travel far, far away, as far away from the, the home counties of South East England as they could possibly get, but also to look far into the future. Um, so let's have another slide. So their dress code integrated the old and the new, the medieval and the modern, uh, the caveman and the robot. So pointy hats, huge, huge shoulders, unfeasibly huge shoulders, skirts slashed to the crotch, leather G-strings, let's look at another one, and brass brassieres. These were all options. And everything had to be handmade and everything had to be decorated with symbolism that communicated that um, antiquarian and futuristic kind of hybrid. The result, I'll show you another slide. Whee. This is a surviving garment, front and back of a surviving garment. The result was fundamentally opposed to contemporary fashion, which they dismissed as, I quote, the insane bowler hat and the unsanitary trousers. They considered fashion to be ugly coloured and badly designed. And they said instead that kin costume, as they called it, releases efficiency, calls forth organic unity, and proclaims dynamic difference in impressive silence. Now, in defence of the mockery that their outfits necessarily prompted, Kibo Kif declared, we're trying to look like what civilised people call ridiculous. We're doing it on purpose. So for Kibo Kift, this was dress as social resistance. It was dress as an objection to dismal daily life. And it was an enactment, to use the language of fashion fictions, it was an enactment of the alternative society that they wished to inhabit. They were, in contemporary parlance, being the change that they wanted to see. So the world that they dreamed of was spiritually rich, it was creatively meaningful, it was resourceful, and it was purposeful. And dressing for that world might magically, performatively, produce world peace. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> um. <laughs> that fiction sadly never came to pass, but for anyone who would like to follow in Kibo Kift's footsteps, they helpfully and literally left us the dress patterns from which to fashion that new world. So that's my first story. And the second group, next slide, is um, a group that in some ways, well, it shares some membership with Kibbo Kifts, but in some ways it's the sort of sartorial opposite. So rather than dressing to the nines for cultural transformation, in interwar England, the founders of nudism as a new social movement rejected dress entirely. Clothes they felt were outmoded. Design evolution, as they understood it, was making clothes necessarily lighter and simpler. It was inevitable that they were going to fall away completely. So let's have another slide. Nudists saw themselves as ahead of this historical and evolutionary curve. I'm showing you one of their magazines here that says the future of British nudism. This is from July 1933. And uh, they saw themselves as being kind of ahead of the curve. So they predicted nude futures where it would be as bizarre to be dressed on city streets as it was to be nude in their own time. And they were writing in the 1920s about 100 years ahead. So they were imagining now this didn't come to pass. So um, like contributors to fashion fictions, the founders of nudism had identified a problem and the problem was fashion. So they called fashion a tin pot goddess, but it was more than fashion, it was clothes. It was every aspect of clothing. They were asking radical questions. They asked, what are clothes even for? 
And in that First World War, post First World War period that they inhabited, when every aspect of living and loving and eating and communicating was being fundamentally rethought, they took the concept of clothing apart at the seams. So um, they believed by dismantling dress, they could dismantle everything that dress represented. And that was social norms. It was class hierarchies and it was gender inequalities. Let's have another image. So nudists wrote in their zealous publications, I'm showing you here the front page of Nudism in Modern Life, which was one of the kind of key early works of uh, early English nudism. Nudists wrote in their publications that clothes signalled everything that was wrong in the world. They were, I'm quoting here, dirty cloth jails. They were a tyranny and they were the iron chains which civilization and custom have riveted on suffering humanity. So they said tight collars were choking wearers, heavy fabrics were causing skin to wither from the lack of exposure to sun and clothes, as they saw it, were killers. So the nudists wanted to get in there first and slash and burn them first. Let's have the final slide. And the outcome that they imagined was freedom, health, liberation, and joy. That's my little presentation, thank you. So back to you, Amy, for let's talk about perhaps parallels, differences, or, um, yeah. Your turn. Yeah, I I saw the Kibo Kift exhibition that you had on at the White Chapel, White Chapel Gallery. Yeah. When was that? 2015, 2016. 2015, 2016. Mm. And I, I think that it blew me away. That just, I mean, the it's so bonkers <laughs> that, I mean, I talked about kind of feeding off the courage of people in the past, and maybe that sounds quite kind of worthy, but I think you can also feed off like the bonkersness of things in the past and the sort of... Yeah, so kind of off the wall, but um, yeah, serious, very very intentional, but mm. also yeah, kind of off the wall at the same time. And I think that mix, um, to, uh, I have a feeling that it fed into the the, the genesis of, of fashion fictions um, along the way. Yeah. So in other, I guess you you've come across quite a range of fictions in the time that we've run um, uh, run workshops and the, the things that you've taken part in. Are there any fictions in particular or, or any maybe any aspects of the process that feel that they particularly connect with the ambitions or the ideas of either of these groups? The there is one I was just looking at on the back table, which was very literally about nudism, wasn't it? I think it was in Australia, which gets around the problem of British nudism, which is, of course, when people are saying, what are clothes even for? One of the quick answers is they're to keep you warm in a cold climate. But that, I noticed that, that fashion fiction was based in Australia. So, um, so that was about a clothing tax, I think, that had been imposed on textiles. And so people had turned to nudism as a way of um yeah kind of dealing with that and had come to embrace it um i think it's that both of these groups are looking into a future i think they're sort of imagining that they're they're seeding the change that will come a hundred years ahead and so it was quite interesting for me as a researcher when i was reading their materials they were often talking about in a hundred years time and that hundred years time would be the time that I was looking at their papers, it was quite an eerie feeling because none of the things, of course, had come to pass. And that's not to say that all of them, we might want them to come to pass, but there's something about looking back at that kind of total vision and total belief that I find, like you, very inspiring, even if it's possibly slightly deranged, there's something about the power and the passion before things have to be moderated. Because of course, I'm talking about nudism, nudism still exists now, and many people who practice nudism and you know, are part of membership organizations, naturists, they call themselves now, um, they don't want to slash and burn clothes. They see that naturism's got a, a function in society, but it was, it's kind of in those moments when things are, yeah, maybe before the reason kicks in, that I find them very exciting, these kinds of groups where they're they're visionary because they're just thinking about 
all of those concepts that you introduced, you know, the, the sort of possibility without the practicalities and inevitably the practicalities kick in. So somebody will say, well, how is wearing this costume going to bring world peace? You know, how is whittling some things in woods in a tent going to deliver a new economic system, which was, you know, that's what they were claiming. And, you know, those, those would be sort of poo-pooed. Well, it, it just is, it's coming, believe in it, do it, and it, you know, it will come. So um, the pragmatics of some of these things fall apart, but there's something to be still retained from the power and the passion and the possibility at the outset. So I like the way you were structuring what you're doing, which is to just put those practicalities aside and do a bit of what people might now call blue sky thinking, interestingly, in Kibbo Kif, they greeted everyone blue sky. So they were doing blue sky thinking. That was their, the way that they said hello to one another was blue skies. Um, so yeah, they were kind of doing some crazy um, fantasy, but there's maybe, um, yeah, there's a kernel of emotion and intention that we can keep from them. And they had some pretty decent styles as well. I, didn't, I don't know if you told me before that they, um, that you went to the exhibition, but that's that's interesting that it's sort of seeded in because I can see there's some parallels too. Mm. Yeah, one thing that's um, occurring to me as you're talking is that um, like I really, really, I like all of the stages, but I do really like stage three where we get to play at like enacting the world. Um, and I, I've been trying to work out like what for me, like what's the real key that makes like a good stage three activity. And it's something about the embodiment that you're like actually doing it and you're actually doing it with your body feels very important and that you're sort of doing it this sounds a bit daft but you're kind of doing it with yourself like if you're going to visit the mushrooms you are going to visit the mushrooms like you're there in the field going oh there's a dog walker coming they might think i'm a bit weird <laughs> like at the same yeah. time as kind of saluting some mushrooms um and like the real key to that stage for me is that you discover things by actually trying to do them with your body that you don't find out by just thinking about doing them with your body. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, in both cases, you know, Kibbo Kift kind of going out on their hikes and hand stitching their tents, mm. isn't that right? They yeah, made everything. their tents. I mean, yeah. Um, and the nudists are obviously, I mean, they're very committed, aren't they? You're, you're very much committing to that with your body. So it's that kind of, um, it's very straight, very stage three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's, we, it's time for a break. Thank you for um, your attention, everybody. I've got a little instruction for us for the break. Let me just find where it is. Um, okay, so we're going to have a, a short comfort break. Um, and we're also going to do a mini enactment at the same time. Okay, so we're going to do a 10 minute stage three enactment. Um, we're going to enact the brand new World 204, which was written by Beatrice, who's at the back there. Um, um, I, I, I kind of ordered this one. I've never um, commissioned a fiction before <laughs> for a specific event, but Beatrice did a great job of uh, coming up with it. So I'll read the fiction to you and then I'll give you I'll add a little bit more. So, in World 204, it is the cultural norm in the UK to compliment strangers on what they're wearing. <laughs> when meeting someone for the first time, instead of remarking on the weather, you comment on their outfit in a friendly manner. For example, the colour, silhouette or print. So this world embraces individuality through words of affirmation and a shared appreciation of the unique qualities of clothes. The origins of this culture can be traced back to the actions of a small group of activists in 1968, which sought to teach people to rethink how we make judgments based on appearance. So I invite you for the 10 minutes of the break, if you feel comfortable doing so, to step into World 204 and to engage in this practice of complimenting whoever you encounter Definitely not just the people that you're with, but you know, anyone else that you might come across, complimenting them on, on your outfit. So that's your challenge uh, for 10 minutes, get some more food um, and then we'll, we'll start again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
We've all gone quiet, so we'd better start again. <laughs> it's the moment. Okay, thanks everybody. I hope you had a little taste of World 204 um, and you've been complimented appropriately on your outfits. Um, okay, so in this second part, I'm just going to um, say a little bit more about the project as a way of um, introducing the kind of theme of uh, post-growth. Uh, that will connect us to our next guest uh, on the chat show, Kate Fletcher. Um, and then, as I said, at the, uh, after that, we'll have time for some questions. So please get thinking of your questions. So, as I said, the, the kind of, um, as I was developing the idea for this project, I was thinking, how can I be helpful? And I was very much thinking about that in in terms of this, this issue of the ever-growing volumes of clothes that are being produced um, and an industry and an, an economic model that it encourages that to happen. So the, the Fashion Fictions project as a whole is really acknowledging um, the huge reduction in resource use that will be needed if we are to develop fashion systems that work within ecological limits and that we absolutely need to go in the opposite direction to these ever-increasing volumes of garments being produced and the need to address that at a sort of paradigm level. Moving from incremental changes to the design and manufacture of clothes to radically different ways of fashioning our identities, feeding off the, the courage of the Kibo Kift and the, and the nudists along the way. So, yeah, it just feels so evident to me that, that post-growth systems will involve different social and cultural norms, different economies, different ways of living with our clothes. So uh, this kind of this, this notion is really um, driving the project as a whole. And I don't specify uh, that people have to engage explicitly with the kind of post-growth agenda uh, in their fictions. The invitation is open. It's, it's, the question is basically, what do you wish for? And, you know, it's really open to what people come up with. But I definitely encourage people to question the fashion systems, establish norms in their speculations and to think big. Um, and I think that this, you know, I'm talking about fashion fictions as a post-growth project. And my, um, I guess, my ability to do that, my confidence in doing that has been really supported and inspired by the work of Kate over um, many years. So um, she's one of the most cited scholars in fashion and sustainability and her work, including that on systems change, post-growth fashion, fashion localism, decentering durability and earth logic defines and challenges the field. So adding to my pile, um, I've, I've got one, one of Kate's um, wonderful range of books. I didn't bring them all because I really wouldn't have been able to carry my bag. Um, but this one is craft of use, post-growth fashion. And I think having post-growth fashion on the front of the book um, really made a space for that idea in, in, um, in research and in conversations. So it's valuable to me for that. And also, um, the project that uh, the book is uh, came out of and is focusing on um, has similarities i think to fashion fictions in terms of a sort of um, if i can call it kind of crowdsourcing methodology of um, asking uh, people everyday people the experts in wearing clothes about their uh, their wisdom of, of clothes wearing and looking for the stories of the great things that people are already doing and what we can learn from their, their everyday practices. Um, and then the other, the final item on the teetering pile of books um, is Earth Logic Fashion Action Research Plan, which Kate wrote together with our um, mutual friend, Matilda Tam, uh, and was published in 2019. Um, I'm sure Kate will talk, us, talk to us about Earth Logic, but um, as a kind of summary, I'll quote from Atlas of the Future, which is a wonderful organisation that's been a, a valued partner of fashion fictions 
over the past couple of years in their profile uh, on their website, they describe Earth Logic as a simple yet transformative call to the fashion sector to put Earth first, pledging loyalty to the planet before industry, business and economic growth. And as I say, I'm sure Kate will, will talk us through it, but within Earth Logic are six landscapes for change. And those landscapes really help, like they're, they're very, um, very usable, intentionally kind of accessible and usable and, and things, that you, ideas that you can work with that, that expand our ideas about how and where we can think and act. And I mentioned earlier this idea of kind of fashion fiction's playfulness, helping us to tap into this kind of broad, broader spectrum of sensibilities, spheres of knowledge, bringing more of ourselves to the collective process of transforming our fashion systems. And the, this kind of this broader spectrum, I feel like it is coming through in the themes um, that I'm identifying um, in the activities, the fashion fictions activities that we, we conducted as, as a form of research and the, the data from those activities that I'm analysing, um, which I'm writing about in this book that I'm working on. And they really diverge from kind of mainstream sustainable fashion discourse. So the, the themes that, that come through from the three stages created by people in very different contexts. They're really not focused on things like transparency or metrics or circular economy, the things that we might hear a lot about in the kind of mainstream sustainable fashion world. They're bringing forward things like language, connections with nature, spirituality, community, ritual, alternative forms of organizing, rebellion, and I think I really, they, they don't map neatly onto the landscapes of Earth Logic, but I, I, I feel a kind of um, a kindred kind of thought going on there. Um, that the landscapes of Earth Logic kind of help to show that there's a place for all of these ideas and themes to be explored. So, Kate, hopefully that works as an introduction. If I can hand over to you to maybe talk to us about Earth Logic and uh, you've been a, um, a very valued supporter and friend of Fashion Fictions, an advisor to the project. So you've, you've watched it develop. Um, so yeah, look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, it is a thrill to be here tonight. I so much enjoyed the previous conversation. I, um, I hope we can add a little more. So actually what I thought I would do, given this bit is about post growth, is maybe start by talking a little bit about the Craft of Use project first. Um, I guess the reason for doing that is to build maybe towards Earth Logic and then some of these real sort of common threads with fashion fictions. Um, so the craft of use started as a project in 2008. Um, yeah, I can't even work out. That's a long, like almost 20 years ago now. I mean, um, anyway, that's a bit. Oh, no, is that 20? Oh, 50, 50. Thank you. Um, um, and the the fundamental idea behind it was that the fashion sector cannot continue to grow if it's to respect planetary boundaries. So it's a very sort of simple beginning point. And then I guess that the exciting stuff happens when you try to think, okay, so what then are the opportunities for fashion beyond consumerism and beyond this sort of growth logic mindset? So the project started with a what if question, so I think maybe there is another common thread. So it started with a what if question, which was, what if we paid as much attention to tending, to maintaining, to wearing the clothes that we already have, paid as much attention to that as to designing and creating them? I suppose then it asked, well, what happens then both to us and everything else when you begin to shift this focus? 
And I suppose what use I'm thinking about using things, wearing things, what it begun, becomes to represent are the compelling possibilities for fashion within the things that we already own. And so I think it's true that using things isn't dependent on producing and consuming more. It's not driven by the politics and practices of growth. It's driven by something else entirely. It's driven by a sense of satisfaction, creativity, possibility, maybe capabilities. It comes from a very different place. And because of that, it gives us a glimpse of what else is possible. It is, of course, the case that using things does use some resources, but it's not nearly as much as other paths and routes. There's um, a phrase that I used to use a lot when I was talking, especially to the media, about the craft of use, and it's, it goes something like this. It's not what you've got, it's what you do with it that counts. And it's about this shift from thinking about fashion in terms of what you can buy when you go shopping, through that lens of product-based, to instead something else which is about practices, which is about skills and possibilities. And it also shifts us from thinking about consumers to thinking about instead to users, to wearers, to citizens in this space. And that also sort of, you know, takes the power uh, that maybe we've given to industry back to a different space and begins to open up new possibilities. So that started a long time ago and it ended with a smaller grant, I imagine, than the one you got. Um, we got a grant from the Levy Hume Trust and did a big project also in six continents with loads of different universities. So it involved, first of all, setting up photo shoots where the public were just invited. They would turn up with items of clothing that they wear uh, and want to talk about. And then we ended up doing lots of design work on the back of that, uh, starting from the real world behaviours and lives of users, not from fictionalised as aspirations of, or um, of, of maybe of what fashion is and can be. So it was a wonderful project um, and I think it ended maybe in 2015. Can you? I can't even remember. Sorry, maybe it was before then. I... Anyway, lots of things have happened in between uh, then and now, including uh, a really exciting project called Earth Logic. Uh, and in 2019, as Amy said, that came out. It's a piece of work that I do with my longtime collaborator, Matilda Tam, who's a professor uh, in uh, Linnaeus University in the south of Sweden. Um, so Earth Logic has a subtitle, it's called the Fashion Action Research Plan. And I guess it's all of those things. It's about action, it's about fashion, it's about research. And I guess the important thing here is recognizing that you can't just research separately from taking action, you have to do it all together at the same time. And so it's about the simultaneous finding things out, beginning to understand them and try them out at the same time, which again is a really beautiful parallel with fashion fictions. Anyway, so what is Earth Logic? It's a visionary, I would say, uh, and radical invitation to fashion business, to fashion practitioners, to the media, to citizens, to researchers, to policy makers and more, to call out as a fiction the idea that sustainability goals can be achieved within the economic growth logic. That's a fiction, they can't be. And instead to envision uh, fashion which is connected with nature, people and long-term healthy futures. And it does this, as Amy said, by quite a simple sort of shift, by placing earth first, before profit, before everything else. 
So the name Earth Logic is a bit of a riff. It's a replacement of growth logic, the logic of economic growth that drives the sector with a new logic, the logic of the Earth. Um, it's lots of different things in there, but as Amy mentioned, there are six different landscapes, as we call them. These are like territories or places where work can be based. And they're sort of attempting to give people a push forward into a, a space of lots of excitement and possibilities. Um, the six of them, and I'm just going to read them out because I think there are loads of parallels with probably the things you've seen on your tables. The first is less. So this is where activity, all fashion activity, has to fit within Earth's limits. And depending on who you look to for a sense of what sort of reduction we're facing, um, it's between four and uh, a factor four, sorry, and a factor 20, which is the difference uh, right up to 95% reduction from current levels, which obviously is quite extreme and difficult. Uh, but it's, these are the sorts of projections that other people, not Matilda and I, other people are saying is necessary. Uh, the second landscape is called local. This is uh, a scaling and recentering of activity rooted in place and community. Then there's plural, which is building social justice and diversity of imagination into this space and also recognizing that you can't do less without plural. It's not like every place on the world needs to have a 75% reduction because there's some places that need to grow still. So some of the poorest communities in different continents need to grow, but it's less for some, um, I should say. There's also learning and unlearning, how to educate, research and innovate differently. There's languaging, how to create mind shift, mindset shifts with words, imagery and stories. And there's governance. This is about how to organise, regulate, negotiate differently. So there's loads of different things going on in Earth Logic that has some parallels with fashion fictions. But I also wanted to share with you some of the reflections that, I, that Matilda and I have had since um, doing the the Earth Logic work in 2019, and it's done loads of different things since. Um, I guess one of the things that has been difficult is that we're always asked, maybe especially by journalists, but by other people too, for examples of brands and products that demonstrate Earth Logic. And it's so incredibly frustrating that all of the time people sort of revert back to the old paradigm and want demonstrations of things which are drawn from the consumer world largely or from ideas about fashion that are really based in a different sort of logic. Interestingly, I think fashion fictions actually builds this new body of experience and um, an imagination that now, when people ask me that question, oh, you know, what, give us an example of Earth Logic work, I think we can begin to go, aha, here is a huge body of examples. And there's so many parallels that I think fashion fictions and Earth Logic have this a really interesting resonance together and really build from that. Another things, one of the things that we have realized is that people find rocket science much sexier than common sense. Um, but I think maybe what we see is that actually uh, the things that we need to make happen are the common sense things. The good news is, of course, that fashion fiction is sexy and it's not <laughs> rocket science. So it maybe fits in there somewhere. Um, it's also, we know, very difficult to bring forward new possibilities when you're rooted in the old paradigm. Working to try to free yourself from that is very challenging every step of the way. 
And this maybe has been one of the things that Matilda and I have benefited being like two people working in this. It's like you've always got someone else there to spare you on. So the fact that most of this, Amy, I think you've been doing, well, you've been championing it with a team under you, and maybe that's why you've managed to, to keep going forward. I think we've understood that people, individuals, as people, they get the challenge of Earth Logic and want to be part of it. Institutions find it almost impossible. And this is, again, one of those moments where I think we're on the cusp of change, but what slows things down are the businesses, the organisations and the institutions. The important thing, of course, to remember is that every institution is made up of individuals. So we're trying to figure that out. Also to say is that people don't like less. Um, but post-growth certainly has removed from being taboo a few years ago, I mean, taboo, to now a thing of curiosity. And that is a, a source of real hope. Um, I think it's also true is that you have to acknowledge emotions um, in this work. And outer change is never bigger than the inner change um, that we need to engage with. And there's loads of fas different fashion fiction projects that really sort of draw upon that. I think it's also true that we've seen through Earth Logic that we need to rescue hope from abstract projections into the future. Um, and instead, we need hope to create the relationships and the movements in the present. And I think that's something, again, that fashion fiction tries to do and is a big parallel with what Earth Logic is about. And whatever happens in the future really depends on the quality of relationships that we have now, much more than the accuracy of the images going forward. It's about these sense of relational connections and worlds and that understanding that everything depends on us together and our sense of our place on in this earth. We have a new Earth Logic book that just actually uh, came out yesterday. Um, it's not yet a physical book, but it will be, but it's now free to download on the Earth Logic website. It's called Earth Logic Gardening, and it's a practical guide to growing change in loads of different ways and places. And here we're drawing on the metaphor of gardening and the actual techniques of gardening to try to seed the way of doing things that are in a different way than the growth logic way. The growth logic way uses methods and processes that are always going to lead you down particular routes. What we need instead is to foster different ways of engaging with things. So Earth Logic Gardening is now available. We are going to have a launch at some point. OK, I don't know whether that's the end of it, but I've seen to have put numbers and I've lost track of where I was. <laughs> anyway, Amy, I'm going to hand back to you. I think this is the time I pass back to you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Kate. Um, really, yeah, I've been really um, so inspired by your work and by Earth Logic that it's really uh, very satisfying to feel those connections developing uh, between the two um, between the two projects and look forward to seeing where that will go in the future. Um, so we, we only have a bit of time left, so I'm going to open it up to questions. So I'm hoping that somebody is sitting there itching to ask a question. Yes, oh, we've got two. Okay, excellent. Let's start now. So uh, I was wondering um, so the between the between Um So if we think that ultra fast fashion is growing out of a relationship directly with social media, I'm wondering what role um, do you think the social media can have in extending fashion fiction to create a new narrative? Okay, so maybe if I just repeat that. Sure. Uh, so no, I, I was going to repeat it so, so everyone can hear. That's okay. Um, so the question about kind of the, the link between social media and fast fashion and those things kind of fueling each other um, and what role social media might play in fashion fiction's activities. Yeah. yeah. So 
I guess one thing that I've done is um, at the start of this year, I, I started a kind of uh, strand of activity of trying to run open enactments that anyone can get involved in um, and ran uh, an uh, enactment of World 45. Fashion Fiction's fans, of course, will remember that. That is the world where um, all, cur all, all textiles must be initially hung as curtains for a period of one year before you can do anything else with them. Um, I wrote that one. Um, <laughs> and the group who, who developed it uh, into uh, the, the prototype uh, got really into, like they built this very um, detailed vision of this world, but part of it was about this kind of uh, quite spiritual connection between people and their textiles. And I turned that into an enactment that was hosted on Instagram and run on Instagram called Material Mindfulness, where people could um, join in every day. There was a one word prompt um, and it prompted people to look in their wardrobes and find something um, that related to the prompt and share a close-up photo of it um, and ideally to wear that item for the day. Uh, and it, it, I mean, it didn't go viral, I won't go that far, um, but it did engage a re like, it, it, I think it became meaningful for people and there was a few people here who, who took part. Um, and it, I think the people who took part, I felt this really nice connection with each other. And I think, if I, if I think back to, I'm kind of uh, riffing a little bit here, but um, <clears throat> in, in folk fashion, when I was thinking about homemade clothes and what, it, what the experiences of wearing homemade clothes in a culture where most things come from the shops, one key issue, I think, is kind of social validation. So you buy something from the shops, there's been like a chain of professionals who have said like, this is an okay thing. It's gone through lots of those hands. I mean, you might be dubious about some of those decisions occasionally, but whereas if you make something yourself, you're on in kind of risky territory. Um, and so what's nice about kind of um, sewing cultures on, on uh, social media is that people have an alternative source of validation. They, have an, they find a community of people who are going, yeah, that's great, you've done well, like good work. And there's kind of that, an alternative form of validation. And I think what was really nice to see is like kind of a seed of something that could, ha could grow and could um, develop is that there was this kind of temporary community of people taking part and uh, taking part in the, the challenge. And there was lovely conversations happening between people in the, in the comments. Um, and I think it was, I was, I was spotting that kind of alternative validation, you know, kind of, you know, everything. So the, the social aspects of fashion are, are so key, aren't they? And I think I saw that happening. I don't know if either of you have any thoughts to add there. I've got well, I, I, may, I can add, I, I could add, but maybe should we ask, uh, listen to the second question if we have short of time? I have no idea what the time is. We've, we've got like five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So I was thinking, this is a really indirect way to answer the question, but I, I, I was thinking about the idea of commitment strategies. So. I first discovered these in a, in a book of an economic historian who talked about these, this phenomena of commitment strategies which every society has and they change all the time and they help people balance the needs of uh, the short term, the moment, with long term security. And in the past, these commitment strategies have been things like prudence and self-control. But these are not powerful enough to overcome social media. And social media has really made many of the things that in the past we used to help regulate consumption. They've, they've just completely blown them out of the water. So I guess what I was wondering was, whether social media itself could come up with some strategies to help balance uh, the, its commitment to long-term thinking. Because I guess it's got to come from within, the culture from within. I've got a 19-year-old son and he's completely deleted all social media. He was like, oh, it's just so boring. And I guess that there's going to be a moment where people, I mean, not everyone, he's just like one lad, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. 
why has he done that? I'm just something now. I didn't ask him. Um, <laughs> I just suddenly realised. But I guess that maybe from within and tasked with that sort of thing. I mean, one commitment strategy is price. And that ha- is always a way to get people to commit to something when you pay a lot of money for it. But there's all these other things too. So maybe social media can help in that regard. Anyway. Write a fiction of it. So, <laughs> write the fiction where a movement emerges from in, within social media that has a commitment strategy, and then we'll have a fiction to read about it, and then we can enact it, and then it becomes true. We just need to do these collective hallucinations and make them as big as we can. Yes. Okay. Luna, did you have a question? Uh, yes. I was just wondering if you looked into any parallels between the sort of experimental archaeology that goes on with uh, sort of textile and homemakers recreating items and techniques and really endangered crafts from the past to get a view into what historical life might have been like in a more intimate way than being in a museum or something like that. I was wondering if you'd seen the parallels and thought about it in the parallels between enactment and re-enactment. Mm, nice question. Thank you, Luna. So for anyone who didn't hear, that was a question about uh, whether I had looked at experimental archaeology. So as I understand experimental archaeology, that's where you try and do the thing that you think people did in the past as a way of discovering how did they make those flint something or others, or maybe things more recently than that, but the, <laughs> trying to reverse engineer what, what practices were people doing. Flint um, a flint, some, flint something or other. I'm, I'm really good at history. I don't know if you can tell this. Um, um, and, where, and, and the links between that kind of practice and the enactments, which I agree, are, there's really nice connections there. Um, I haven't looked at them directly, but you've given me something to think about. Um, but yeah, there's really nice connections between the enactments and like, I guess, a number of practices. So I find myself Googling LARPing quite a lot, which is live action role play um, and kind of reading quite strange, <laughs> strange things to contextualise what it is that I'm, I'm doing. Uh, there's really interesting movements of, or, or kind of areas of people doing this kind of embodied activity to test something out in really different spheres. So there's really nice stuff in kind of design anthropology um, as well. Bella, you were nodding. Did you have something to add? You looked like you would do. Nothing clever to say really, but I do think that sort of idea of ritual and performance is really important. You mentioned earlier that you think the sort of the going out and doing it with your body is really important and I think um, it's something about, I use that sort of term performativity, like you bring it into being by doing it and you do this rehearsal that performance theorists would talk about kind of twice behave behaviour if you kind of learn to do these things and you can, you know, you can do it for real in the real world. So fashion fiction is a kind of rehearsal for what's possible. <laughs> Um, so I think that's really interesting as a, as a sort of way of thinking about it. Um, it's sort of enacting something that's not yet happened. It's a, a future that might be possible. Um, I was thinking about the earlier question as well, the, um, the idea about sort of social media and what might, how social media might be involved in these things. I do think that sort of community organising, a sort of group that you've gathered together of 3,000 people in six, Continents is really, really impressive, and it's you know, those are the things that will build into meaningful change. I think because um, it isn't about kind of going outside of society, it's about creating alternative social movements, isn't it? To be able to make these things happen and to do them in groups. So, definitely, the people that I've been looking at, they were seriously engaged with media, they were self promoters. That's how I've been able to research them historically, is because they left all these sources behind, but they understood that the media was a tool through which they could propagandise and spread their message mm. and create engagement. Um, so I think that's really important. And right at the very beginning, you said something about fashion otherwise, which I just thought was a really lovely phrase. I don't know if that's your phrase or 
a phrase he got from somewhere else. And it reminds me of Education Otherwise. I don't know if you know the organisation Education Otherwise, which is for people who homeschool their children in this country. So um, it's a group of homeschoolers. So they're all kind of taking their kids out of the conventional school system and on a very individualised basis, they might be doing it their own way at home, but then they organise so all the individual homeschoolers come together in this organisation, education otherwise. So I thought that was a sort of good model for thinking about withdrawing, creating an alternative and then come, coming back together as a, as a community somehow. Mm -hmm. So there's just... Um, no, no. So just on the archaeology thing, so there is a research project, I think it's funded by the EU, um, that I only heard about recently, so I actually can't remember what it's called, but you could probably find it. So it's textile archaeologists who are looking at old practices and um, various different groups, and they're trying to hold or um, understand some of that behaviour within a sustainability context. I mean, I've never, sorry, I'd never heard of it before. Um, so there are people who are actively drawing links in that way. I'm just going to pass it on. Thanks. The speaker says it's time to stop <laughs> getting the message from above. Um, so, yeah. We've run out of time, so we'll draw to a close there. Um, thank you very much for... Oh, Kate has a few copies of Earth Logic. Copies of Earth Logic to give away. Anyone who wants one, for the... come to <laughs> I okay. have more at home, but I didn't know if they would go. So. Okay. Hold on to your seats for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, I guess we'll finish off. I will say thank you very much for coming and for giving your attention um, so generously. Um, the project is an open invitation, so please, if you uh, would like to contribute, you'll be welcomed with open arms. The website, fashionfictions.org, has instructions on, on the invitations to get involved. If you look at the fictions, if you look through the worlds and you think, well, why isn't the one about this, then please write it. If you look at the prototypes and you think, well, there should be a prototype of this, please make it. If you want to enact one of the worlds, please get in touch with us and find a way to do it. It's, it. The project absolutely doesn't exist. It would just be me thinking very weird thoughts by myself at home <laughs> if it wasn't for all of the people who join in. Um, and that's not much fun. I really feed off the creativity of everybody else. So thanks so much for coming. And uh, it's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>